Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Mastering Mentorship Podcast. I am your host, Doug Stewart, and today's topic is confidence. How in the world do you become more confident? And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of confidence primarily because of my teaching schedule here lately. Uh, just this week, I graduated a group from the Skills for Success program and have literally a dozen specific examples of people who dramatically develop their confidence in real meaning and t- meaningful and tangible ways. And then after graduation, the next morning I woke up and did two days uh, with my Dale Carnegie team and took 20 people through our high impact presentations program where you see a tremendous amount of newfound confidence in people. And then last night I had another Dale Carnegie session where I had the opportunity to see breakthroughs happen and confidence grow. And um, it's just incredible what happens to people, right? Because the thing about confidence is it's almost like money, right? Because confidence, having more confidence doesn't change who you are. It just exposes who you are more clearly, kind of like money, right? You've heard people win the lottery and they're like, the money changed him. The money didn't change that person. The money exposed that person for who they were. And so the more confidence we can have, the more we can show up as our most authentic selves. Now, one of the problems with confidence is that confidence, not all confidence is created equal. So it reminds me of a time when I was eight. And when I was eight years old, my favorite Disney movie was Robin Hood. The Disney version, not the later version, but the cartoon version. And there was something about Robin Hood the Fox that I just thought was the greatest thing ever. And all I ever wanted was a bow and arrow. Now, before you start judging my parents uh, for getting me this said bow and arrow, you should know that I'm from the country. And most of the kids at that time, at my age, already had their first rifle. So it was actually very... um, very acceptable for my parents to have bought me a bow and arrow instead of a rifle. Because if you knew me when I was a kid, you know that I did not need to be anywhere around firearms for any reason. But I talked my mom into buying me this bow and arrow. And I didn't want just any bow and arrow. I wanted a green one because Robin Hood wore that green outfit and I thought it was so cool. And so she agreed to get me this bow and arrow. And so she got me a green bow and arrow, like a simple bow and arrow, not not a compound bow, just a regular one. She got me this simple bow and arrow. And when I unpacked it, I was a little frustrated because the arrows weren't actually arrows. They were like kid arrows that had like these big tennis balls on the end. So I went back to my mom and I was like, mom, I'm grown. I'm eight years old. This is for kids. The bow is okay. I need real arrows. And so me and mom went down to the Walmart (laughs) and you know, you're from the country, right? If you don't call it Walmart, you call it the Walmart, but that's, that's, that's maybe a different episode. And so we go down to the Walmart and we get me two arrows, the real ones. And so I come back home, I grab my green bow, I take my two arrows and I go out into the yard I put the first one in, I pull it back, let it go, and bam, right smack dab in the middle of a tree. Perfect shot. And so I'm thinking like, I I am Robin Hood. I'm not trying to be like, I am. I have mastered this skill. So drunk with this newfound confidence, I took the second arrow, I put it in the bow, I pulled it back as far as I could, I pointed straight up to the sky and I let it go. (laughs) You probably know what happens next. The second this thing left my fingertips, I lost it. I lost it in the sun. I had no idea which way it was coming down. I didn't know how long it would be up there. I just knew that I had made a very, very grave mistake. And I'm again seeing my eight short years of life flashing before my eyes and I didn't know whether to run, whether to stay because I didn't know where this thing was going down. And so I decided to stay put 
<laughs> I held my breath and tried to think <laughs> as thin as I possibly could. What that experience taught me is that confidence is not a decision. And confidence without competence is really a delusion. Another time, a few years later, when I made it, thankfully, to middle school, there was a guy, his name was Todd. Now, my middle school was also an elementary school and a high school. I went to a very small school, about 300 students, so it was from kindergarten to graduation. So when I was in middle school, there was a guy named Todd, and Todd was a grown man, like facial hair, muscles, like he was a big dude. He was one of the like main athletes at the school. And Tom wasn't a Todd wasn't a bully by any stretch of the means. What he was though was one of those guys that was willing to put people in their place when they stepped out of line. One day, maybe I stepped out of line and he embarrassed me in front of my classmates. And I got so angry. In fact, I was so angry I just like stewed the entire day about it. I went home that night and I was so mad. And my dad could tell that like something was bothering me. I was kind of moping around. And so my dad asked me, he's like, what's, what's your problem? And so I told him what had happened. And then I also told him what my plans for the next day was, which was to fight Todd. <laughs> now, <laughs> Todd was four to six inches taller than me and probably outweighed me by a hundred pounds. And I can remember my dad just sort of smiling, <laughs> shaking his head, and just saying to me, you know, that's a that's a really bad plan, son. And I remember I said, I responded to my dad, and I said, Dad, I'm not scared. And my dad said, son, you don't have to be scared to get your ass kicked. <laughs> How's that for advice? <laughs> and the next day, guess what? I found out just how true that was. Because the next day I walked into school, I walked right up to Todd, and I punched him <laughs> right in the chest. Now, I'm not sure what I was expecting to happen. Maybe I was expecting him to like, like explode into a million pieces. <laughs> I really don't know what I was expecting. I wasn't expecting him not to move though. <laughs> I was expecting something. But the second I punched him, it was like I hit a brick wall. And he looked at me and I knew, I knew I had just made a really, really big mistake. So what was there to do? I turned about face and I ran as fast as I can. And he began to chase me. Because like I said, Todd was one of those guys that was willing to put people in their place that had stepped out of line. So as I'm running, he literally chases me all over campus, across most of the campus, and finally catches me in the gym and grabs me, <laughs> throws me to the floor, and proceeds to put me in one of the most epic Ric Flair figure fours you've ever seen. And I really thought that I was going to lose a leg that day. I can remember crying. <laughs> I can remember regretting my decision. And if I wasn't embarrassed the day before, I was definitely embarrassed then because the, the gym was full of people. So essentially, he was putting on a clinic, um, me being the prop. <laughs> and so that led me to another idea, which was confidence is something that you have to prove to yourself. And simply not being afraid isn't the same as confidence. Blind confidence, blind confidence will cripple you faster than a Ric Flair figure four. And so if you can't just decide to be more confident, what in the world can you do to become more confident? So as I look back on my experience and I think about many of the people I've coached, here are three things that I wrote down that I believe can make you and help you to become significantly more confident. The first thing is to demonstrate competency because confidence is incremental and it happens slowly over time as we demonstrate competence because the truth is, is you have to earn the right. You have to prove to yourself 
And that's what makes you more confident. Now, if you haven't proven it and you're confident, perhaps you're delusional. You know, it's like people ask me a lot. They ask me about um, how can they get an opportunity to give a TEDx talk? And it's interesting to me that when I ask them about how much they're speaking now or how many talks have they given, they look at me in like confusion, like the two things aren't connected. But the truth is, is we have to earn the right to be able to do the things that we dream about doing. And so it's like, you know, an example is the Beatles, right? So the Beatles, the rock band, it took them a decade of playing in smoky bars and no one really listening to them before they became successful. And that's true with everyone else. You see any professional athlete, they've got hours and hours and hours and years of deliberate practice and honing their skills to get them to the place where they're a quote-unquote overnight success. And the truth is there's just no such thing. So for instance, let's go back to the TED Talk thing. If you want to give a TED Talk, the best thing to do is give 100 talks for free before you ever even think about applying to speak. Like you could go to the, you could contact like your local YMCA, you can volunteer at church social events, you can get a group of friends together. Like the next time you go to like guys night or ladies night, just like tell stories, hone your craft, practice. You have to earn the right and develop your skills, then demonstrate competency incrementally over time. And that will help you to develop more confidence. The second thing is you have to be willing to make non-fatal errors. You know that quote, um, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I hate that quote. (laughs) Because that seems to be like the go-to quote when someone's like getting a divorce or they've lost like a loved one or they've gotten laid off. Like the things that we don't really have an answer for, it's really hard to put language or to comfort people that are, they're going through something that's that devastating. So we say, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And I think that's the dumbest advice ever. It's like, congratulations, you haven't died from this yet. And I don't know that I'm with that, but I will tell you that As much as this thing really irritates me, when it comes to developing confidence, it's actually pretty good advice. Because when we put ourselves in a position to take calculated and non-fatal risk, we open ourselves up to real growth. So think about a rose bush, right? So if you have a rose bush and you never prune it, it never meets its potential. It never really blossoms the way it's supposed to. On the other hand, if you have a rose bush and you cut it too deep and you cut it too much and you cut it too far down, it dies and it never blossoms. But over time, if you prune it on a consistent basis and you tend it consistently, pruning it at just the right, in the just the right places at just the right amount, it flourishes and it blooms and it blooms and it blooms and it blooms. The same is true with human beings. So that's why like I tell people when it comes to their comfort zone because one way to become more comfort confident is to become less comfortable <laughs> and to step out of our comfort zone. So one of the things I say when I coach is to find a way to live about 6 feet outside of your comfort zone. It's like pruning a rose bush, right? If you never prune yourself, if you just stay in your comfort zone, you never really grow and develop. But if you go 100 miles outside of your comfort zone, you're likely to do something stupid or to really get hurt or to hurt other people. And so if we stay just a little bit uncomfortable, just a little bit, we just prune ourselves just a little bit every day, that's when we have an opportunity like a rose bush to really flourish. The third thing that you can do to become more confident is to get a mentor. So what I when I think about a mentor, sometimes it can be sort of a, sort of a cloudy or a nebulous idea of like what a mentor is or what role they might play. And so I have a very simple acronym for the role that a mentor plays. And the acronym is MENTOR. So here's what a mentor does. They meet you where you are. 
They encourage your growth. They nudge you toward action. They tackle tough issues. They organize your thought process. They realign your perspective. That is the role of a mentor. Now, you might ask, how in the world? <laughs> like, how in the, like, of course, I want that person. And the truth is that person sounds a lot like Yoda. And the last time I looked around my ecosystem, I didn't see that person signing up to come alongside and help me. And the truth is, is you're probably right. So if you're ask, if you wonder, how do you get that person? How do you get a mentor that's going to do something like that for you? Man, boy, the answer is really simple. The answer is that you don't go looking for them. You do the things that will attract them. So it's like fishing, right? If I, I, I live actually between two lakes and I could pick e- either of those lakes, I could go decide, I'm say, I'm going to go find a fish. I'm going to go, I'm going to go catch a fish today. So I could get in my truck, I could drive down to the lake, I could jump in, I could swim around all day long at either lake and look for fish. And the truth is that I probably, not only will I not catch any fish, I probably won't even see any. And the ones that I do see will probably be those little minnows that just, that just swim along the bank that, that aren't the ones that I'm actually looking for. Now, on the other hand, if I wanted to do something that would attract the fish, I may get a fishing rod. I may get some bait that I know that type of fish likes. And I would do what it takes to attract the fish so that they would come to me, not just aimlessly swim around and hope to goodness that I find what I'm looking for. Because here's the truth about mentors. The best mentors are attracted to people who are curious, who ask questions, who try new things. And the truth is that the best mentors are attracted to people who are already doing their work. And so instead of aimlessly looking for a mentor, the best advice to become more confident and to earn more competence and to get the people around you that are willing to help you get ahead, get through roadblocks, meet you where you are, tackle tough issues, realign your perspective, encourage your growth, nudge you toward action, is to start doing those things now is to start doing your work now. And that is the thing that will not only attract mentors into your life, it'll attract opportunity into your life, and it'll give you the ability to earn the right to become more confident. So here's the thing. If you want to be more confident, it's time to stop waiting to start and start earning the right by demonstrating competency, making calculated and non-fatal errors, and doing the things that will attract the mentors that you want to have. So like I say every week, I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope it was interesting. Um, I actually wrote an article, a blog post that goes along with this uh, in on medium.com if you want to check that out. Um, feel free to give me some feedback at Doug Stewart 919 at most social media places. Rate this, share it, follow it, subscribe to it. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's entertaining. I hope it's educational. But most importantly, the most important thing to me is that you go out and you do something with it. See you next week.